Isabel, what vocal mic should I buy? This has got to be the most common question I'm asked by my students and podcast listeners, hands down. And I get it. Investing in a mic can feel like a big deal. There's so many options to choose from now and everyone you ask will give you a different recommendation. What's a girl to do? And that's why I've created a quick, easy 45 second quiz where you'll be matched with your perfect vocal mic. You'll tell me about your voice, your setup, your needs and your budget and I'll pair you with a vocal mic that's your perfect fit. No more trawling through the internet, scrolling through thousands of online reviews and losing all sense of time and space. And did I mention you'll even receive a free bonus video I recorded in my very own home studio showing you how to position your mic for your best sounding recordings yet. Just go to femalediymusician.com forward slash quiz to take the quiz and get your hands on all of this. That's femalediymusician.com forward slash quiz and get ready to meet your perfect vocal mic. I have a confession to make. Whilst making this episode, I have had pangs of anxiety the whole way through that go something like this. <gasps> no, if everyone knows I have dyslexia and how my mind really works, they won't trust that I know what I'm talking about with all this music tech stuff. Or, no, Isabel, you need to be a geeky tech nerd to be credible as a musician or a teacher. You can't say that you're not interested in all of the gear and memorise all of the names. But having dyslexia means that when I'm putting stuff out into the world for other people to use, learn from, consume, I am now hyper vigilant about the details. But I'm really, really glad I did this episode because I actually really love my dyslexic brain. And if you're also dyslexic, I hope you do too, because we're actually pretty wonderful little creatures. Hello and welcome to Girls Twiddling Knobs. My name's Isabel, and over the last decade, my self-produced and self-released music has amassed over 25 million Spotify streams. I also have a PhD in sonic arts, but I wasn't always this confident with music tech. In fact, I still hear those self-doubt gremlins in my head from time to time. I started this podcast to help more female-identifying musicians start recording and producing their music and learn from other women making music with technology. If that's your cup of tea, then you're in the right place, my friend. Let's dive in. How good is your audio hygiene? I know, I know it's a personal question, but it's a really important one. Because if your recordings sound muddy, boxy or roomy, that's definitely going to be holding your music back. The first thing you need to do to clean up your act will start sound treating your home recording space. And luckily, I've put together a simple but effective three-step guide to sound treating your home recording space, and you can download it now for free. So to grab yours and get your audio hygiene on point, just head to femalediymusician.com forward slash learn with Isabel. That's femalediymusician.com forward slash learn with Isabel. Your music and your listeners will thank you. Well, hello, knob twiddlers. I think it's fair to say that here in the sunny south coast of the UK, spring has finally sprung and I am delighted about that. I hope you're able to get out to smell the flowers and hear the birds. And if you're not, I can highly recommend Gardener's World. But enough about my premature midlife crisis. Let's get into today's episode. And I must confess... This one's as much for my benefit as it may be for yours. You see, I have dyslexia and I have long been curious about how it may have affected me as a musician in both good ways and bad. And since getting into sound and electronic music, I've become specifically interested in if and how my dyslexia could have altered my journey into recording and production too. I guess after teaching for a few years now, I've seen so many other musicians grapple with the wondrous and sometimes infuriating process of learning something new. And what you see time and time again 
is just how differently we all process information and create new things. I am damn sure my dyslexia has positively and negatively affected my learning experience of all aspects of music making. But I want to tease out what exactly this may have meant for my career and work to date in electronic music and music tech by delving into the research and making some hopefully useful and insightful connections. There's no two ways about this, dear listener. I need to do this because my brain does not work how conventional education and academia expects it to and how many conventional music tech spaces do too. But I hope that this journey into the impact of dyslexia on our experience of music tech will be at least interesting for you and at best illuminating if you also have what I think of as a neurodiversity gift, dyslexia. So let's kick off with what exactly is dyslexia? Well, probably a lot of you might think of dyslexia as reading words backwards or swapping letters and words around and finding it very, very difficult to read. And those things can be true, but in essence, it's a form of neurodiversity. It's often called a learning disability and it could be seen as a disability in traditional educational settings fixated on reading and writing, for example, Um, but not for learning in general. And we'll get into this soon. 10% of the UK population actually have dyslexia, although it's probably higher because it's so poorly understood or um, often missed as well when it's a little bit more mild. But the British Dyslexia Association website explains that as each person is unique, so is everyone's experience of dyslexia. It can range from mild to severe and it can co-occur with other learning difficulties. It usually runs in families and is a lifelong condition. It is important to remember that there are positives to thinking differently. Many dyslexic people show strengths in areas such as reasoning and in visual and creative fields. So that's what they say on their website. And I think it's a pretty good explanation. Um, But we will delve into the details of what that really means and the practicalities of how that could affect people in general and as musicians. Um, And in fact, 40% of the UK's self-made millionaires are dyslexic. I did not know this statistic. And that's four times the national average. So that's very, very interesting. So there's a misconception that dyslexia is just to do with poor abilities in reading and spelling, but this is only one aspect to the phenomenon. Um, And we're going to delve into the positives as well as the negatives, but I thought I'd just give you that little statistic there to blow your mind to start off with. So maybe you're listening to this and you're thinking, hmm, I've always wondered if I'm dyslexic. So do you want to find out if you're dyslexic too? Well, um, I very much suggest that you do a dyslexia screening test if you're wondering this question. And um, I have put a link to where to, to access that in the show notes. But just for the sake of it, let's have some fun here on the podcast. Here are some indications taken off of the British Dyslexia Association website. So if you're curious as to whether you may be an adult with dyslexia, See how many of these apply to you. Even get out a piece of paper and a pen right now and tick them off as we go. So, number one, confuse visually similar words such as cat and cot. Number two, you spell erratically. Number three, you find it hard to scan or skim text. Number four, you read or write slowly. Number five, you need to reread paragraphs to understand them. Number six, you find it hard to listen and maintain focus. Number seven, you find it hard to concentrate if there are distractions. Number eight, you feel sensations of mental overload and switching off. Number nine, you have difficulty telling left from right. Number 10, you get confused when given several instructions at once. Number 11, have difficulty organising thoughts on paper. Number 12, often forget conversations or important dates. Number 13, have difficulty with personal organisation, time management and prioritising tasks. Number 14, avoid certain types of work or study. Number 15, find some tasks really easy but unexpectedly challenged by others. And number 16, have poor self-esteem, especially if dyslexic difficulties have not been identified in earlier life. So how did you do? 
Um, just for the record, I scored 11 out of those 16 indicators. So what did you score? Um, and obviously this is definitely not an official screening, but if you are thinking you may have dyslexia, especially as a result of me going through that checklist, um, do get professional help if needed. I've put a link in the show notes to both the British Dyslexia Association's website and also where to get a screening test directly. So now that we've identified some of the indicators for dyslexia, let's think about how this might affect your learning. So before I discuss how dyslexia might affect people working with music technology, let's just identify how people with dyslexia learn. Um, And these are some of the things that they usually find difficult. Usually people with dyslexia find something called phonetic decoding difficult. Now, phonetic decoding is where there's a symbol and by seeing that symbol, you sound it in your head based on the sound that you've been taught. You can perceive the meaning of the sound in your head and then you can verbally articulate that by recalling that meaning and that sound after seeing that symbol. So obviously this is how we read. Reading is a series of symbols, i.e. letters, which come together into bigger symbols and more complicated symbols, which are words. Um, And when we read those letters and words, we sound them in our head and that translates into a meaning. And then we can recall that meaning and regurgitate it and replicate it by writing it too. Um, And not only can we write the sound as it sounds to us, but we can remember exactly the order of those symbols to create the sound for somebody else in their head. So this is why a lot of people have difficulty reading, spelling and recalling these words. Dyslexic people find this phonetic decoding more challenging. It takes longer for people with dyslexia to learn this. And there's some very interesting um, reasons why, from a neuroscientific perspective, I'm not going to go into all of them here, um, but I have put a link to a video that I think you might find interesting if this is something you're curious about. Um, I have a couple of examples of this myself in a music tech context. I think that growing up, I always had this idea that my dyslexia was about me reading and writing, but it's also about me speaking, as in me remembering terms and remembering how to express these concepts that I know already inside. When I was giving a paper presentation um, during a academic conference, when I was studying for my PhD at the Sonic Arts Research Centre, I was asked to talk about the process of making one of my pieces that I was presenting and I used um, binaural recording and therefore I started talking about what are called HRTFs. HRTFs stand for Head Related Transfer Functions. I said Head Related Transfer Frequencies and um, just that slip up was so embarrassing. It made me feel so on the back foot. I know what they are. I know what they are. It's the way that the sound waves are traveling over the head and the torso, to put it very simply. But in that moment, I just could not recall the right terminology. So it's very frustrating because it makes you feel and look like you haven't learned something when in fact you just haven't memorized the exact terminology. When in fact you may fully grasp the concept, in fact you may be intimately acquainted with the concept by making music with it. Um, Another thing that people with dyslexia often find difficult with learning is memory. So obviously this links to phonetic decoding. I've just explained how memory has been um, a difficulty there for me with remembering terminology and how to spell things and all that stuff. But also for people with dyslexia, it could be names, it could be dates, it could even be directions. And personally, I have a really good memory for directions. I don't have a good memory for anything relating to words and directions, including street names, landmarks. I really cannot remember that element. I can describe landmarks to you and I can direct myself really, really well. I can pick up orientation very quickly. Um, But it's the words that I find so hard to recall. Another thing that people with dyslexia find challenging is they have a difficulty with focusing on tasks and focusing on instructions, both written and verbal. 
So this is obviously not great if you're at school and you're sitting and listening to somebody teach you something. And I definitely have a tendency to zone out. So some things I have tremendous attention for. And these are usually things that I'm doing. Things when I'm physically, experientially involved in an action, an act of doing. When it's something that I'm studying, I have to really work on my focus. And I have really, really worked on my focus over the last few years. But I've had to train myself to hold my attention for other less active things. Also, people with dyslexia can feel sensations of mental overload. It's literally like too much information. And when, I, when I've when i been researching this as an adult just for this podcast episode, in my mind, I'm thinking, yes, this is so frustrating because I just cannot cram as much stuff into my head as other musicians I know. I tend to get uber familiar with a selection of albums, artists, ideas or books rather than constantly consuming new stuff. Because when I constantly consume new stuff, that fully frazzles my brain. But I find that I get so much out of less. It's almost like a type of kind of cultural resourcefulness. I can have so many ideas and so many creative insights from not very much. But if I overload myself, I I almost have some kind of form of internal burnout or zone out. Um, Dyslexic people can also have difficulty with personal organisation and time management. Um, Also organising thoughts on paper. And I have had to work hard to now be pretty good at these. Um, I, like I've said before, I've done a lot of work on on this and this is an area of my life that I feel um, really very confident with. It's the stuff that I've mentioned just before, the memory and the phonetic decoding that I find so hard. Um, And lastly, um, dyslexic people can have poor self-esteem stemming from all of the above. And lastly, lastly, I know, I know, I will have left something out But I have a lot to cover, so feel free to check out more info on the British Dyslexia Association website. The link is in the show notes. So what are the learning strengths for dyslexics? Because there are many, actually. While dyslexics can have a difficulty with memory, especially memorising terminology and symbols and things like that, they can have a very strong memory for stories. Most of our world is made up of stories, especially when it's put through our human filter. So obviously this can be a real um, source of strength and ability for people with dyslexia. People with dyslexia often are excellent at puzzle solving as well. So dyslexics are quick to spot patterns and solutions to problems too. Um, They're brilliant with spatial reasoning. They're very quick to pick up dimensions and movements and also remembering a virtual field And we could think of music as a virtual field, of course, for sure. And we'll talk about this a bit later on. Um, There are also great conversationalists. So this makes dyslexics good at reading people and responding appropriately. They can also be tremendous empathisers. And this could be due to experiencing adversity through learning in a word heavy world. They're also wonderfully imaginative. So this means they are able to to more quickly envision new possibilities and futures. They can also be abstract thinkers. So they can be good at learning to conceptualise intangible ideas such as love or deception, for example. And they often think outside the box. So they're able to come up with more unorthodox ideas, hence the entrepreneurship streak that we looked at before with the 40% of UK millionaires, self-made millionaires being dyslexic. They can also be very good at, as, at critical thinking. So interestingly, contrary to what our reading, writing obsessed school system might have you believe, dyslexics are often very good at logical reasoning. This is why they can spot patterns and understand narratives so well. They astutely analyse stories told or read to them. So dyslexics can understand and decode plot lines, characters, situations and their interconnecting meanings better than most. And all of the above speaks to why dyslexics may be so um, good at certain vocations such as um, the arts and also engineering. So this to me does not sound like a disability and it hasn't felt like one either. It's a difference. And there is a difference. 
it's a phenomenon where someone might find certain types of learning and communication easier or more difficult, as we just outlined. So I feel like I should probably share some of my experiences of having dyslexia um, as a human, as a composer, as a producer. So I was screened for dyslexia in my first year of my undergrad at 19 years old and I have dyslexia. I have had dyslexia the whole of my life. I felt it acutely at primary school, secondary school, but it wasn't until I got to the first year of my undergrad where I really wanted to do something about it, which may sound crazy, but the last thing I wanted to do when I was in primary school and secondary school was have extra lessons after school in the place that I found so difficult and frustrating and where I felt like a failure the last thing I wanted to do when all my friends were going leaving school to go home and play in the park the last thing I wanted to do was sit there and learn spelling so I didn't get any help apart from my mum is actually a special needs teacher and I think because I presented with lots of different skills as well as challenges my parents felt like it was okay for me to not get tested and, um, you know, have official help because my mum could do so much with me at home and she did. However, when I got to my undergrad and I was studying music at Dartington College of Arts, for the first time in my life, I was actually learning things that I passionately cared about to do with experimental music, sound, listening and everything in between. And it was incredible. And I I looked at the three years ahead of me and I thought, I do not want my dyslexia to hold me back. I want to see how far I can go. And so I went and got tested and I'm really glad I did. Um, I decided I didn't want any extra help. I decided I would just take the free equipment, which included a laptop. But I really, really, again, just did not want to spend any extra time with somebody giving me instructions, which I found difficult anyway, on how to spell and read. So I spent lots of time myself in the library and I taught myself to read quicker, which was hard, obviously, and I taught myself to write better. And that was a wonderful turning point for me and I started to really build my confidence and and properly feel for the first time that my dyslexia was not a barometer of my intelligence. My dyslexia was more a sign that my brain was just slightly different and I learnt differently and I communicated more easily in different ways. So I have difficulties and abilities with many of the classic dyslexic characteristics outlined before. I don't have dyscalculia, which is where you find the same problem with numbers as people with dyslexic find with words and other types of language and often the two can go hand in hand but I'm actually pretty um, normal if not slightly on the upper end when it comes to numbers. I also don't have issues with directions so I'm very confident reading maps and I also have pretty good personal organisation although this is definitely something I've worked on and as mentioned before dyslexia is more a spectrum than a fixed set of characteristics so no two people are going to present the same. What I do have issues with is, as I've said before, phonetic decoding, memory, and I used to have issues with focusing my attention on any task that wasn't directly experiential. I'm also highly imaginative, empathic, analytical, logical, creative and spatially aware. So how do these traits impact how I produce music and sound? Now, I've spoken openly on this podcast about how I think my gender has affected this process, but... I also think that dyslexia has as well. You see, music technology is not only male-dominated, it is often also symbol and word-dominated too. And I know that might sound counterintuitive as it's all about the sound, right? But the culture surrounding those sounds very much values the following. Terminology, knowledge of repertoire, word-based instructions, and in more hardcore physics-based areas, Algebra 2... And if you can master memorising, ingesting and recalling these, many people will believe you're a good musician and producer because you appear to know a lot. 
And you very well might do, but this often takes precedence over other just as important characteristics that other art forms might value more highly, such as abstract thinking, critical thinking, creativity and imagination, conceptual and lateral thinking, empathy and intuition. So let me be clear. This is not to say these things are not important or that no one in music technology thinks they're important at all. It's just that these skills do not carry as much weight or respect as knowing the names of every single mic the Beatles used in the making of Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club, for example, or the name of every single parameter on any given reverb plugin on the market. I know you may be listening to this and thinking, that's not true, it's way more important to make good music, whether or not you remember all these details or not, and I agree. But I cannot deny having felt at a total disadvantage due to my frustrating lack of phonetic decoding skills. In fact, every time in the making of this episode that I have made a note of phonetic decoding, I have had to check the term because I find it so bloody hard to remember. And having all of this at your fingertips is really impressive and convincing to other people, regardless of whether your music is in any way interesting or meaningful at all. Not having this memory of terminology and symbols and words and names and dates, not having this can quickly make you look like you actually don't know what you're talking about. That, alongside with being a woman in music, has been so exhausting, both inside academia and within the industry. So let's have a think about the more broad impact on how some of the difficulties dyslexic people face might impact upon their abilities with music technology. There are various studies on the relationship between dyslexia and music in general, but there isn't much research on how dyslexia impacts musicians in electronic music specifically. However, I did find an article called Dyslexia and Learning Computer Programming, where Norman Powell and colleagues discussed how dyslexia might affect the process of learning to code and program using technology, which I very much argue would have a lot of parallels with electronic music and music technology in general. So what they found in their study was they were looking at the factors of dyslexia and then mapping that across the different processes and stages of computer programming. And then they were um, thinking about how this may or may not impact upon people with dyslexia's ability to code and program. They also interviewed people who had dyslexia who worked in computer programming too. So they have these these kind of comparisons of, on the one hand, um, reviewing the literature, mapping this across processes and programming, but also then real people's experiences as well. So what they concluded was that if you have dyslexia, then you're very good at conceptualising problems and therefore identifying solutions and and algorithms that may speak to those problems. Um, You could be bad, though, at analysing the finer details and then making amendments to these finer details, too, within said algorithms or codes. Um, You could be good at conceptualising programmes and visualising their holistic overview. So seeing the bigger picture and seeing how all the bits fit together as a whole. And you also could be good at evaluating their effectiveness and reconceptualising if needed. Um, I think the study could have been more explicit exploring how the issues of phonetic decoding and dyslexia might impact upon computer programming. Um, For example, I found the algebra aspect of my Sonic Arts MA almost impossible. I could not translate the symbols into meaningful narratives inside of my head, let alone remember how to regurgitate them in an algorithm. Likewise, I found Maximus P, which is a computer programming software, almost impossible because of its reliance on coding and symbols. I kept forgetting what they meant, how they needed to be ordered and how they needed to be spelt, etc. So I think that that's still an area of study that really needs to be looked at because that's so integral to certain types of electronic music and music technology. But also, I have found notation difficult for this very reason, music notation. Even after hours and hours of music theory studying, it was like reading another language. And I am not alone. A 1998 study at Leiden University in the Netherlands examined the differences between dyslexic children and non-dyslexic children when learning music notation. 
The researchers found that this dyslexic children took significantly longer to internalise the meaning of the notation and made almost twice as many mistakes as the non-dyslexic children. Similar to reading and writing, issues with phonetic decoding and memory appear to be the biggest challenge. And I was a classic dyslexic child when it came to music theory. I scraped my grade five. I worked my arse off to scrape my grade five, I should say. However, I find the visual medium of my door much easier to use. And I think this is because it works on multiple levels, such as through colours, shapes and patterns, as well as words and numbers. It also has more of a developed spatial field and I love things that are spatialised. That's often how I think. So the fact that there is not just a back and forth, but an up and down and a depth almost as well between different windows inside of the door. I find that more natural to think about making music than music notation. Um also, the, the waveform of sound, I find cutting and editing and fading and uh, building and piecing together and crafting the audio sound channels, the actual visual sound waves on my computer, so satisfying. And that is a detailed activity I could do for hours and I have done for hours in my life. So I love that kind of sound editing. That's really like my dyslexic brain is firing in all cylinders because it's visual, it's spatial, it's to do with colour, it's to do with um, shapes. And um, that's something that I find really, really satisfying. I can also imagine 3D objects rotating in my head. So I love fitting shapes together while I lie in bed. I'm a classic dyslexic in that sense. I will lie in bed and I will just fit shapes together for fun in 3D in my mind. <laughs> and I think it's why I enjoy the spatial experience of listening to music and creating music that relies on this as the main dialogue rather than an abstract language of symbols and terminology such as music theory or such as describing blow by blow the process of my recordings or my production in terms of equipment and uh, plugins and software and terminology. Um, I'm much more interested in that, I guess, more ephemeral, intuitive, instinctual experience of sound resonating in space with you. That's the language I, I speak when it comes to production. So how does a dyslexic music producer produce music? We've looked at lots of different factors to do with dyslexia, the good, the bad and the ugly. And obviously every person with dyslexia is different. So every dyslexic composer and producer will have totally different skills and challenges. I guess I can only really speak from my own experience and I'm largely a classic dyslexic and have worked incredibly hard to overcome the challenges that this has brought. What about the adverse effects, though? I've already outlined some of the areas of music production I struggle with that's linked to dyslexia. I cannot remember what 80% of the software and hardware I've used over my musical lifetime is called. That's the phonetic decoding and memory again. Thank you, dyslexia. I'm also not very interested in this. Maybe it's because that's just my personality. Maybe it's because I find it hard and therefore I don't enjoy it. Or maybe it's something of a combination and maybe that's okay. I'm also not too interested in collecting bits of kit. My setup is very minimal. In fact, I enjoy being resourceful. I find it hugely creative. I like to see what I can get out of not very much. I also really don't enjoy watching videos where faceless people describe blow by blow how they did something or the detailed processes for replicating it yourself, which I do make myself watch sometimes as it is obviously useful. But I'm actually really good at this, doing things in slightly different ways with my composition, recording and production techniques, intuitively feeling into original processes in order to craft my own sound producing music that blends multiple concepts, instruments, textures and genres in order to express a more complex narrative and identity, listening and responding to sound in ways that interweave with my voice and my musical ideas. This is the lateral thinking and visual imagination, of course, and I also think of my music as a map or a 3D building in my mind. 
It's how I was able to write a whole album in my head when I had no use of my voice and my hands. And if you're interested in what that might sound like, check out my album Chalk Flint, which I've linked to in the show notes. It's also how I was able to translate my songwriting practice into electroacoustic music and soundscape compositions to during my PhD. You see, when I think about music and sound, I see pathways in my mind. It's why my PhD is titled My Words Trace a Path, Encounters with Place Through Voice, Performance and Field Recording. I guess in that sense, I engineer my music through an internal sonic architecture in my head. I see interconnected patterns, often before they're audible. I don't think of it as seeing, though. I'm not using sight. This is why I never thought I was a visual person. I sense the space inside my head and my body. That feels different. It's a different sense. But if you think about it, that's exactly what we do when we are listening. We are sensing space with our hearing, whether real or simulated, present or imagined. And this is how my dyslexic brain works. I don't remember all the names of the microphones, the plugins or the mixing desks. I have to look that stuff up for my students because my memory is so shocking. My dyslexic brain is busy doing other things. And as I say this here to you, dear listener, on the podcast, I'm honestly fine with that. It's just it's a different story when I enter certain contexts. In fact, nearly all music tech spaces where phonetic decoding and memory are highly valued and a way of demonstrating your validity. That's when it gets hugely frustrating. It's hard to not get angry at the outside world. It's even harder not to turn it back on yourself. And this is why imposter syndrome is rife in people with dyslexia. I often find myself telling the same old story I heard in school growing up, that my lack of memory and phonetic decoding skills was due to laziness and a lack of focused willpower, and that if I just tried harder, I could be as good as everyone else, if not better, because I am clearly an intelligent person. I always felt not good enough, and I was angry sometimes at school because I'd be paraded on stage for every school musical, parents' evening, concert or school inspection because of my singing abilities, like I was some kind of trophy student. But still, I wasn't good enough because I found remembering processes and words and dates and numbers difficult and arbitrary. I was much more interested in experiences and concepts and stories and feelings and senses and different ways of knowing. And lastly, dyslexia has made me become very used to not knowing exactly what's going on and taking a leap of faith anyway. This is how I learnt to read as a dyslexic kid. Most of the time it's like you're reading but in French and you're doing double the work as your fellow classmates but you have to do it anyway. You have to just keep going. I don't need to read a manual ten times before I muster up the guts to plug in something and play. I'm very comfortable just giving it a go, just preferably when no one's watching. Although I would likely have learnt so much more over the years had the culture been more open to this way of learning and publicly making mistakes too. I've had the guts to forge a totally DIY music career without even having any management by myself even though I had no idea what I was doing at first. It's why I've now even launched my own business, teaching women to self-record and self-produce their music, even though I'd never started any kind of business like this before. I am used to failure. I failed multiple times growing up. Every single day walking into school, it felt like there was imminent failure. I have failed as an adult too, but those failures have often turned into successes and, at the very least, some incredible experiences too. I also strongly believe that, as well as being a woman in music, having dyslexia is why I have patience and empathy as a teacher for my students who might struggle with certain aspects of learning, and why I'm able to speak with absolute authenticity when I tell them I am 100% confident that they can learn anything they put their mind to. Because I know what it's like to have ideas, talent and critical self-awareness, but just not be able to replicate that in ways that the traditional learning spaces might value. So, in short, I definitely believe that dyslexia has both positively and negatively 
impacted upon my ability to produce music and work with music tech and that could likely be the case for other people too. There is no doubt that having issues with memory, especially regarding reading, integrating and recalling symbols and words, will make navigating the culture of music technology especially more challenging, as well as some of the practical applications. There's also no doubt, however, that dyslexic musicians bring integral skills of creativity, imagination, spatial awareness and lateral thinking to this field as well. Now, I do believe that having dyslexia has made my learning of music technology more challenging and will continue to do so in the future. I also believe this has been compounded by the difficulties of being a woman in music as well. Not remembering the name of a synthesizer may feel like a total giveaway of someone who is both too lazy to properly learn about music tech and a woman who isn't naturally made for this stuff. The two combined, dyslexia and my gender, can be quite the head melt from time to time in the field of music tech. And I am so glad I made this episode, even though it took a fair bit of research and piecing it together, because it has helped me to understand what this really is that's going on. And this this kind of complex combination of both my gender and dyslexia. And of course, there's other factors, too. I also hope that if you're a musician who knows or suspects that they have dyslexia too, that you have a little more clarity on how this may have affected your relationship with music tech in both positive and negative ways. And maybe you don't have dyslexia yourself. If that's the case, I hope it's been interesting nonetheless. And I hope to follow this episode up with some conversations on how different types of neurodiversity have affected other musicians too. So finally, I have a confession to make. Whilst making this episode, I have had pangs of anxiety the whole way through that go something like this. <gasps> no, if everyone knows I have dyslexia and how my mind really works, they won't trust that I know what I'm talking about with all this music tech stuff. Or, no, Isabel, you need to be a geeky tech nerd to be credible as a musician or a teacher. You can't say that you're not interested in all of the gear and memorise all of the names. But having dyslexia doesn't mean I don't respect and attend to the finer details when they're required of me. I really do. And having dyslexia means that when I'm putting stuff out into the world for other people to use, learn from, consume, I am now hyper vigilant about the details. But I'm really, really glad I did this episode because I actually really love my dyslexic brain. And if you're also dyslexic, I hope you do too. Because we're actually pretty wonderful little creatures. And remember, if you're keen to get your audio hygiene on point, grab my free three-step guide to sound treating your home recording space from femalediymusician.com forward slash learn with Isabel. It's your fast track to cleaner, more professional sounding recordings without even upgrading your gear. Now, in next week's episode, I'll be talking to the wonderful Emma Louise Butt about her research into the lack of diversity in sound design and audio production for TV and film. Emma has worked on some incredible projects with organisations such as the Imperial War Museum and the BBC over her career to date, including doing the sound design for EastEnders, which happens to be my favourite soap of all time. But until then, take care and I'll catch you in the next episode. Just one final thing, dear listener. I just wanted to ask what you thought of today's episode. Did you love it? Did it make you feel emotions and stuff? Did it give you a whole new philosophy on the meaning of life? No? Okay, well, fair enough. But if you liked it at all, just share a teeny weeny review wherever you're listening because, number one, my ego likes a massage and, more importantly, two, I can learn what you're loving and want more of. Oh, and three, it'll boost our ranking in the podcast algorithm, meaning more women and girls will hear all this girls twiddling knobs goodness. Triple win. I can't wait to read your review.